सी आई ई टी एन सी ई आर टी प्रेजेंट्स ऑडियो बुक ऑफ सोशल साइंसेस फॉर क्लास सेवन ऑडियो बुक सोशल एंड पोलिटिकल लाइफ पार्ट टू क्लास सेवन चैप्टर एट टाइटल्ड अ शर्ट इन द मार्केट फ्रॉम पेज नंबर नाइंटी टू टू वन हंड्रेड एंड वन Now let's listen to chapter 8 titled A Shirt in the Market Page number 92 Chapter 8 A Shirt in the Market This chapter tells us the story of a shirt It begins with the production of cotton and ends with the sale of the shirt We shall see that a chain of markets links the producer of cotton to the buyer of the shirt in the supermarket. Buying and selling takes place at every step in the chain. Does everyone benefit equally from this, or do some people benefit more than others? We shall find out. Here on page number ninety-two, there is a collage given in the form of a shirt. In this collage some pictures are given like the crop of cotton two farmers in the field cloth making factory and a cloth seller page number 93 a cotton farmer in kurnool swapna a small farmer in kurnool in andhra pradesh grows cotton on her small piece of land the bolls of the cotton plant are ripe and some have already burst so swapna is busy picking cotton the bolls which carry the cotton in them do not burst open all at once so it takes several days to harvest the cotton once the cotton is collected Instead of selling it at Kurnool Cotton Market, Swapna and her husband take the harvest to the local trader. At the beginning of the cropping season, Swapna had borrowed rupees two thousand five hundred from the trader at a very high interest rate to buy seeds, fertilizers, pesticides for cultivation. At that time, the local trader made Swapna agree to another condition. he made her promise to sell all her cotton to him cultivation of cotton requires high levels of inputs such as fertilizers and pesticides and the farmers have to incur heavy expenses on account of these most often the small farmers need to borrow money to meet these expenses at the trader's yard two of his men weigh the bags of cotton at a price of rupees 1500 per quintal the cotton fetches rupees 6000 the trader deducts rupees 3000 for repayment of loan and interest and pays swapna rupees 3000 swapna says 3000 only the trader says cotton is selling cheap There is a lot of cotton in the market Swapna says I have toiled so hard for 4 months to grow this cotton you can see how fine and clean the cotton is this time I had hoped to get a much better price On page number 93 there is a diagram of a cotton plant given In various steps it is given how the cotton reaches from the farmer and the trader to the factory or the yarn dealers or the mill step 1 trader sells the cotton at the kurnool cotton market step 2 ginning mill buys the cotton step 3 ginning mill removes the seeds and presses the cotton into bales Step four, spinning mill buys the bales. Step five, spinning mill spins the cotton into yarn. Step six, spinning mills sells the yarn to yarn dealers. Did Swapna get a fair price on the cotton? 
Why did the trader pay Swapna a low price? Where do you think large farmers would sell their cotton? How is their situation different from Swapna? Page number 94 Trader Amma, I am giving you a good price. Other traders are not even paying this much. You can check at the Kurnool market if you do not believe me. Swapna replies. Don't be angry. Uh, how can I doubt you? I had only hoped that we would earn enough from the cotton crop to last us a few months. Though Swapna knows that cotton will sell for at least rupees 1,800 per quintal, she doesn't argue further. The trader is a powerful man in the village and the farmers have to depend on him for loans, not only for cultivation, but also to meet other exigencies such as illnesses, children's school fees. Also, there are times in the year when there is no work and no income for the farmers. So, borrowing money is the only means of survival. Swapna's earnings from cotton cultivation is barely more than what she might have earned as a wage labourer. The Cloth Market of Erode Erode's bi-weekly cloth market in Tamil Nadu is one of the largest cloth markets in the world. A large variety of cloth is sold in this market. Cloth that is made by weavers in the villages around is also brought here for sale. Around the market are offices of cloth merchants who buy this cloth. Other traders from many South Indian towns also come and purchase cloth in this market. On page number 94, there is a picture of a shop in Erode in Tamil Nadu given here. On market days, you would also find weavers bringing cloth that has been made on order from the merchant. These merchants supply cloth on order to garment manufacturers and exporters around the country. They purchase the yarn and give instructions to the weavers about the kind of cloth that is to be made. In the given example, we can hear how this is done. Page number 95 There are three different pictures given on page number 95. Next to these pictures, a write-up has been given to explain these pictures. Picture 1 This is a merchant's shop in the bazaar. Over the years, these traders have developed extensive contacts with garment firms around the country from whom they get orders. These traders purchase the yarn or thread from others. 2. The weavers live in villages around and take the yarn supplied by these traders to their homes where the looms are located in sheds adjacent to their houses. This photograph shows a power loom in one such home. The weavers and their families spend long hours working on these looms. Most weaving units have about two to eight power looms on which the yarn is woven into cloth. A variety of saris, towels, shirting, ladies' dress material and bed sheets are produced in these looms. Picture 3. They then bring back the finished cloth to the traders. Here, they can be seen getting ready to go to the merchant in the town. The trader keeps an account of the yarn given and pays them money for weaving this into cloth. What are these people doing at the Erode cloth market? Merchants, weavers, exporters. In what ways are weavers dependent on cloth merchants? Putting out system, weavers producing cloth at home. The merchant distributes work among the weavers based on the orders he has received for cloth. The weavers get the yarn from the merchant and supply him the cloth. 
For the weavers, this arrangement seemingly has two advantages. The weavers do not have to spend their money on purchase of yarn. Also, the problem of selling the finished cloth is taken care of. Weavers know from the outset what cloth they should make and how much of it is to be woven. However, this dependence on the merchants both for raw materials and markets means that the merchants have a lot of power. They give orders for what is to be made and they pay a very low price for making the cloth. The weavers have no way of knowing who they are making the cloth for or at what price it will be sold. At the cloth market, the merchants sell the cloth to the garment factories. In this way, the market works more in favor of the merchants. Page number 96. Weavers invest all their savings or borrow money at high interest rates to buy looms. Each loom costs rupees 20,000. So a small weaver with two looms has to invest rupees 40,000. The work on these looms cannot be done alone. The weaver and another adult member of his family work up to 12 hours a day to produce cloth. For all this work, they earn about rupees 3,500 per month. The arrangement between the merchant and the weavers is an example of putting out system whereby the merchant supplies the raw material and receives the finished product. It is prevalent in the weaving industry in most regions of India. If the weavers were to buy yarn on their own and sell cloth, they would probably earn three times more. Do you think this is possible? How? Discuss. Do you find similar putting out arrangements in making papads, masalas, beeris. Find out about this in your area and discuss in class. You might have heard of cooperatives in your area. It could be in milk, provisions, paddy, etc. Find out for whose benefit they were set up. Here on page number 96, there is a colored box given. Inside the box, there is a picture of a lady weaver weaving the cloth. The title of the box reads Weaver's Cooperative. It reads We have seen that the weavers are paid very little by the merchant under the putting out system. Weaver's cooperatives are one way to reduce the dependence on the merchant and to earn a higher income for the weavers. In a cooperative, people with common interests come together and work for their mutual benefit. In a weaver's cooperative, the weavers form a group and take up certain activities collectively. They procure yarn from the yarn dealer and distribute it among the weavers. The cooperative also does the marketing. So, the role of the merchant is reduced and weavers get a fair price on the cloth. At times, the government helps the cooperatives by buying cloth from them at a reasonable price. For instance, the Tamil Nadu government runs a free school uniform program in the state. The government procures the cloth for this program from the power loom weavers cooperatives. Similarly, the government buys cloth from the hand loom weavers cooperatives and sells it through stores known as co-optics. You might have come across one of these stores in your town. Page number 97 Here on page number 97, some women workers swing buttons in a garment factory are given. The Garment Exporting Factory near Delhi the Erode merchant supplies the cotton cloth produced by the weavers to a garment exporting factory near Delhi. The garment exporting factory will use the cloth to make shirts. The shirts will be exported to foreign buyers. 
among the foreign buyers are business persons from the US and Europe who run a chain of stores. These large stores do business strictly on their own terms. They demand the lowest prices from the supplier. In addition, they set high standards for quality of production and timely delivery. Any defects or delay in delivery is dealt with strictly. So, the exporter tries his best to meet the conditions set by these powerful buyers. Faced with such pressures from the buyers, the government exporting factories, in turn, try to cut costs. They get the maximum work out of the workers at the lowest possible wages. This way, they can maximize their own profits and also supply the garments to foreign buyers at a cheap price. What are the demands foreign buyers make on the garment exporters? Why do the garment exporters agree to these demands? How do the garment exporters meet the conditions set by the foreign buyers? Page number 98 The Impex garment factory has 70 workers. Most of them are women. Most of these workers are employed on a temporary basis. This means that whenever the employer feels that a worker is not needed, the worker can be asked to leave. Workers' wages are fixed according to their skills. The highest paid among the workers are the tailors who get about rupees 3000 per month. Women are employed as helpers for thread cutting, buttoning, ironing and packaging. These jobs have the lowest wages. On page number 98, there is a colored box given with the breakup of payments given to workers per month. It reads, tailoring, rupees 3000, ironing, rupees 1.5 per piece, checking, rupees 2000, thread cutting and buttoning, rupees 1500 why do you think more women are employed in the impex garment factory discuss write a letter to the minister asking for what you think would be proper payment to the workers the shirt given here reads the profit made by the business person and the various costs that he had to pay Find out from the diagram given here what the cost price includes. On the shirt diagram it is written Purchase rupees 300 Storage etc rupees 200 Advertising rupees 400 and Profit rupees 900 The shirt in the United States a number of shirts are on display at a large clothes shop in the United States and are priced at $26. That is, each shirt sells for $26 or around 1,800 rupees. Use the diagram given here in the margin to fill in the blanks given here. The business person purchased the shirt from the garment exporter in Delhi for rupees dash per shirt. He then spent rupees dash for advertising in the media and another rupees dash per shirt on storage, display and all other charges. Thus, the cost to this person is rupees 900 while he sells the shirt for rupees 1800. Rupees dash is his profit on one shirt. If he is able to sell a large number of shirts, his profit will be higher. The garment exporter sold the shirt at rupees 300 per piece. The cloth and other raw materials cost him rupees 100 per shirt. The workers' wages cost another rupees 25 per shirt. The cost of running his office came to rupees 25 per shirt. Can you calculate the profit per shirt for the garment exporter? Page number 99. Who are the gainers in the market? 
A chain of markets links the producer of cotton to the buyer at the supermarket. Buying and selling takes place at every step in the chain. Let us recall who were the people who were involved in this process of buying and selling. Did they all gain as much? There were people who made profits in the market and there were some who did not gain as much from this buying and selling. Despite their having toiled very hard, they earned little. Can you place them in the table given here? There is a table given here on page number 99 which is divided into two parts. In the first part, it is written, people who gained in the market. Three blank spaces are given here to write the names of people who gained in the market. In the next part of the picture, it is written, people who didn't gain as much in the market. Again, three blank spaces are given here as well. You have to write the names of people who did not gain as much in the market. Compare the earnings per shirt of the worker in the garment factory, the garment exporter and the business person in the market abroad. What do you find? What are the reasons that the business person is able to make a huge profit in the market? You have read the chapter on advertising. Why does the business person spend rupees 300 per shirt on advertising? Discuss. Market and equality. The foreign business person made huge profits in the market. Compared to this, the garment exporter made only moderate profits. On the other hand, the earnings of the workers at the garment export factory are barely enough to cover their day-to-day -day needs. Similarly, we saw the small cotton farmer and the weaver at a road put in long hours of hard work, but they did not get a fair price in the market for what they produced. The merchants or traders are somewhere in between. Compared to the weavers, they have earned more, but it is still much less than the exporter. Thus, not everyone gains equally in the market. Democracy is also about getting a fair wage in the market. Whether it is Kanta or Swapna, if families don't earn enough, how would they think of themselves as equal to others? On one hand, the market offers people opportunities for work and to be able to sell things that they grow or produce. It could be the farmer selling cotton or the weaver producing cloth. On the other hand, it is usually the rich and the powerful that get the maximum earnings from the market. These are the people who have money and own the factories, the large shops, large land holdings, etc. Page number 100. There is a picture given here on page 100 of a shop selling ready-made garments. There is a note given beside the picture which reads, did you know that the ready-made clothes that you buy require the work of so many different persons? There is another picture given here on page 100 depicting goal number 8 of Sustainable Development Goal SDG by www.in.undp.org. Many factory workers are shown in the picture. The words written above the picture are Decent work and economic growth. The poor have to depend on the rich and the powerful for various things. They have to depend for loans as in the case of Swapna, the small farmer. For raw materials and marketing of their goods, viewers in the putting out system. And most often for employment workers at the garment factory. Because of this dependence, the poor are exploited in the market. There are ways to overcome these, such as forming cooperative of producers and ensuring that laws are followed strictly. In the last chapter, 
we will read about how one such fish workers' cooperative was started on the Tawa River. Page number 101. Exercises 1. What made Swapna sell the cotton to the trader instead of selling at the Kurnoon cotton market? 2. Describe the conditions of employment as well as the wages of workers in the garment exporting factory. Do you think the workers get a fair deal? 3. Think of something common that we use. It could be sugar, tea, milk, pen, paper, pencil, etc. Discuss through what chain of markets this reaches you. Can you think of the people that help in the production or trade? 4. Arrange the statements given alongside in the correct order and then fill in the numbers in the cotton balls accordingly. The first two have already been done for you. There are some statements given here along question number 4. These statements have to be put in the diagram accordingly as per the correct order. The statements given here are 1. Swapna sells the cotton to the trader. 2. Customers buy these shirts in a supermarket. 3. Trader sells cotton to the ginning mill. 4. Garment exporters buy the cloth from the merchants for making shirts. 5. Yarn dealers or merchants give the yarn to the weavers. 6. The exporter sells shirts to the business person from the USA. 7. Spinning mill buys the cotton and sells yarn to the yarn dealers. 8. Weavers return with the cloth. 9. Ginning mill cleans the cotton and makes it into bales. You have to put these statements in the right order and then fill in the numbers in the cotton balls. Glossary Ginning mill A factory where seeds are removed from cotton balls. The cotton is pressed into bales to be sent for spinning into thread. Exporter A person who sells goods abroad. Profit The amount that is left or gained from earnings after deducting all the costs. If the costs are more than the earnings, it would lead to a loss. You were just listening to chapter number 8, titled, A Shirt in the Market. With it, chapter 8 of total 9 chapters ends here. Narrators, Shalini Singh and Vebhav Srivastav. You were just listening to this audio book. Technical control, Bati Langlingdo. Technical assistance, Mayank Kumar. Assistance in production, Tanu Gupta. Direction and production, Vandana Arimardan. This audio book is brought to you by CIET and CERT, New Delhi, India.